We're very excited today to have one of our own Historical Society um, staff members, Lindsay Tran. So Lindsay um, is the Historic Architecture Specialist at the Historical Society. So she manages the Federal Historic Preservation Tax Incentives Program within the State Historic Preservation Office. Um, she conducts architectural review um, for projects subject to state and federal laws and gives technical preservation guidance to the public. Um, so she's originally from Bozeman, graduated from the University of Montana with a bachelor's degree in history, and then she earned a Master of Science in Historic Preservation from the University of Oregon before moving back to Montana to work with us. And she also writes regularly for Distinctly Montanan. Um, so today, we're lucky enough to have her share some of her research that she's done into Mary McLean um, and her life in Butte, Montana. So welcome, Lindsay Tran. Thank you, Al. Can everyone hear me? Yes. No? Should I move it? Well, I am using a mic. It's right here. <laughs> Can you hear that? OK, that's good. All right. Um, thank you for having me. Thanks for coming out tonight. This is incredible. I was not expecting this many people. So this is fantastic. Lau forgot to mention that she is um, speaking next week at, um, is it Touchmark? Yes. Lau on um, pre-contact archaeology. Um, that's at 1 PM, I think, at Touchmark. So if that's of interest to you, you guys should check out Lau's talk. Um, so I'm really excited to be here tonight to talk about Mary McLean. She is a writer whom um, I didn't. Who in here already has heard of Mary McLean or knows about her? OK, so like half and half. I didn't find out who she was until I was in like my late 20s. And it was kind of by accident. I was in the gift shop at the Museum of the Rockies in Bozeman. Um, and I saw her. You'll see a cover of the reissue of her book. This was the cover that I saw on the shelf, and it didn't fit in. It, there was like, you know, all these like plushy dinosaurs and like books about geology. And then there's this book with this woman with these piercing eyes on the front. And I'm like, what the heck is this? So I had to buy it. Um, and that's how I found out about her. So I'm really um, glad to be um, talking about her writing tonight, talking about her life. I'm super excited to see some young folks in the audience um, um, and older folks, but young folks especially, because she is a young person's writer. She wrote her first book when she was 18. It was published when she was 19. And I just feel like if I had found her earlier, like who knows what would have happened. She's a, <laughs> she's a, she's a really great writer, but she's a young person's writer. Um, you know, and the, I gave this talk. Um, down in um, Butte uh, for the first time like about a couple months ago. And my angle on it when I was down in Butte, I was at the um, B'nai Israel um, Cultural Institute. And my angle on it then, I got a little bit nervous like reading excerpts from her writing. And I was like, oh, you know, teenagers, you know, re because she's 19 years old, she's writing this book. And, but I don't think I'm going to take that angle tonight. Um, because it does a disservice to McLean and it does a disservice to her writing and it's too easy to dismiss her for being young when she was writing um, because she continued to write and she continued to develop as, as a writer and that's kind of what I want to um, talk about tonight. Um, so um, in 1902, 19-year-old um, Mary McLean of Butte, Montana, sent off a handwritten manuscript containing three months' worth of journal entries to Fleming H. Revel Company, which, is a well -known, which was a well-known Chicago publisher of evangelical Christian literature. The title, I Await the Devil's Coming. This is the cover that I saw on the shelf <laughs> at the Museum of the Rockies. Um, in her journal entries, McLean expressed her scathing but uh, heartfelt opinions on the harm of conventional middle-class mores across such diverse arenas as religion, marriage, uh, sexuality, and the freedom of creative expression. <laughs> she writes, for example, in Idle Brain is the devil's workshop, they say. It is an absurdly incongruous statement. For if the devil is at work in a brain, it certainly is not idle. <laughs> 
And when one considers how brilliant a personage the devil is, and what very fine work he turns out, it becomes an open question whether he would have the slightest use for most of the idle brains that cumber the earth. So for McLean, the devil um, in I Await the Devil's Coming, which again was the title of her manuscript, the devil was more um, of a literary mechanism than a literal figure. Um, he was a metaphor that everything um, that at 19 years old remained out of Mary's grasp. Wealth, fame, love, intellectual stimulation, and uncompromised companionship. So between the content of the book, you know, the excerpt that we just read, um, and its title, her manuscript seems a really unlikely fit for an evangelical Christian publishing house. Um, you know, maybe she meant it like as a provocation when she sent it off. Um, oh, whoops. Um, I'm having trouble, Anthony, with the scrolling of my notes again. Maybe she meant it as a provocation. Um, maybe she, uh, you know, um, was making a strategic move. Um, thinking that they would publish it out, you know, yeah, I'm good. Maybe they would publish it out just out of like sheer outrage, um, you know, but we don't, we don't really know. We don't really know what her angle was. It could have been either or, you know, with the way that she talked about her writing, it really could have gone either way. Um, to quote Miley Cyrus, Haters are going to hate, but haters are also going to click on your YouTube video. <laughs> so McLean was already anticipating the reaction that she was um, going to get from the reading public, and she clearly intended to use it to her advantage. Uh, the savviness is one of the reasons that both scholars and fans of McLean have said that she would have thrived as a social media influencer. This is like serious academic scho scholarship. They're saying she would have been a great influencer. I'm like, I don't know. Um, so the editor at um, the editor, okay, at this evangelical Christian publishing house, recognized the quality of her writing, and instead of like throwing it into the trash, he sent the manuscript on to a publishing house that he thought would be a better fit. This publishing house was Herbert and Stone. Herbert and Stone, also in Chicago, um, had published a few years before, I think in 1899, um, a book called The Awakening by Kate Chopin. Has anyone heard of that book? Yeah. It's a kind of like a seminal work of um, the, the, it has become a seminal work of the feminist movement. Um, it was placed, a novel placed, a novel placed in the American South um, about a woman that, this is um, uh, Chopin. Um, a woman who feels mounting internal conflict about what is expected of her as a mother and as a wife. Um, the Awakening helped usher in um, the modernist movement, modernist writing, and like I said, eventually became a seminal text of the feminist movement. Um, McLean's writing in its own way follows the Awakening, but it also, um, in theme and form, takes a much more transgressive turn. And although the feminist movement claims McLean as one of their own, she was so misanthropic and so averse to group activities that I don't think she, I don't think she ever participated in like a political like rally or you know meeting in her life. I mean, if she did, she never wrote about it, and she wrote about most everything she did. So, McLean's book is not a novel unlike The Awakening. It's not a novel. It's not a diary, um, but it's not a memoir. Um, Await the Devil's Coming is often characterized as um, what we call today a confessional, which is a decidedly modern, like 20th century, 20th century genre that um, some argue got even more popular in the 21st century, um, thanks to the rise of the personal blog and the internet's infatuation around like 2008 with um, what we now call the personal essay. Um, and the personal essays, you, anyone could write them, but they were written especially um, in the early aughts by young women. Um, 
young, young journalists or women aspiring to be journalists. Um, personally, um, for what it's worth, I don't know that a, a confessional is really the right label for McLean's writing because the very etymology of the word confession implies feeling some kind of shame um, and feelings of like wrongdoing. And this is not at all um, what McLean felt. She did not feel ashamed of anything. If you read her books, um, she was very proud of her intelligence. She was proud of the things that made her odd, that made her not fit in, in Butte and in her family. Um, she described herself literally as without parallel among all her hundreds of acquaintances. Um, let's see. So this is what she says. Um, I am filled with an ambition. I wish to give the world a naked portrayal of Mary McLean. Her wooden heart, sorry, her good young woman's body, her mind, her soul. So, I mean, it, it may be a confession, but it's not a confession out of feeling like there's anything wrong with her or a feeling like she needs to fix herself. She was very happy with who she was. Maybe not with her writing. You know, she was very critical of her writing, but not with who she was as a person. Um, so, Hold on a second. OK, so Lucille Monroe, um, she was the same editor who um, had championed Chopin's manuscript before it got published. She was like the um, literary editor at Herbert and Stone, and she was the one who urged her boss to publish I Await the Devil's Coming. Herbert and Stone released her uh, McLean's book under like a much, much less edgy title. called the, It was called The Story of Mary McLean. Um, I, before I came tonight to talk, I just looked out of curiosity to see if our library has a copy of the book. And they do, they have two copies. They have a copy um, under the original title, I Await the Devil's Coming, with that same cover. And they also have a copy of the story of Mary McLean. So the same book under two titles, and both are checked out, which is <laughs> great. It's awesome. Um, the book, and this is incredible, the book sold 80,000 copies in its first month. Okay, this was 1902, 80,000 copies. This earned McLean, okay, at 19 years old, she earned about 20 grand, um, which when you do the conversion, I didn't do it myself, but I read what other people said, it's about half a million dollars. That's what she made. Um, and I'm sure that she made even more because it went through many printings and was published in like, or translated into like 20 or 30 languages. So she was like an international phenomenon at 19 years old. Um, so Mary begins her book, I Await the Devil's Coming, with a summary of what she calls her uninteresting history. Quote, uninteresting history. So let's start with that. Um, she was born in 1981. Um, 1981, 1881, <laughs> that's her in the middle. I, I, I feel like I mix it up because when I was like reading this book for the first time, I thought it was like a, a historical fiction. I had to keep looking back and being like, when was this book written? Just because of her voice and the way, the feeling she expresses, it's so modern. Like it's not what you would expect someone in, like an Edwardian writer to be talking about. It's not staid, it's not stuffy. I mean, it is kind of, wordy and purple at times, but it's like what she's writing, what she's expressing, I mean, there are feelings that I think I could relate. I mean, I was able to relate to them 100 years later. Um, so she was born in 1881 in Winnipeg. Um, her dad, James, uh, is right there. He was a civil servant. Um, she had three siblings. Um, her mom's name was Margaret. Uh, they lived in a really large house. Their lifestyle was reportedly very comfortable. They had like servants and everything. Um, when she was four years old, her dad, who turned out to be a huge adrenaline junkie, decided that he was gonna take the family to Western Minnesota. I don't know why there, cause he like wanted to be a gold miner. I don't know if there was <laughs> gold in Western Minnesota. I have no idea. I never looked into it. Maybe someone knows if you know, please please let me know. 
So he moved them to Western Minnesota, like a super small town. Um, and then they moved to Great Falls, um, where he earned the name Flatboat Charlie because he was an adrenaline junkie. Um, he died when uh, McLean was eight years old. Margaret, her mom, remarried, and the whole family uh, moved to Butte, where her stepfather proceeded to squander her and her siblings' inheritance on who knows what. Um, but by the time Mary was old enough to go to college, she and her younger sister actually, um, they didn't have the money to go. The story goes, I don't know how true this is, but that they were standing on the platform, the train platform in Butte, her and her sister ready to go to Stanford, and her dad, their, her, their stepdad came and was like, uh, sorry, like the money's gone, you have to stay here. And I think that her younger sister did a little bit, coped a little bit better with it, but I think Mary, the way that she writes about it and the fact that she I think she like started taking a test to be a librarian and halfway through the test she just kind of like started writing this surrealist like um, stream of consciousness essay. She was not happy to be stuck in Butte, not happy at all. Um, this is what she says about her relationship with her mom. Uh, my mother, having been with me during the whole of my 19 years, has an utterly distorted idea of my nature and its desires, if indeed she has any idea of it. My sister and brothers are not interested in me and my analyses and philosophy and my wants. Their own are strictly practical and material. The love and sympathy between human beings is to them, it seems, a thing only for people in books. So um, like most teens, I mean, clearly she felt estranged from her family, um, but she expressed it in a very eloquent way that most teens probably would not be able to. I mean, I don't think I could have done that at 18 years old, or if I did, it would have been in different words. Um, <laughs> so she, uh, yeah, she has, a, um, she has a distinct voice, that's for sure. Um, so this is a picture of Butte, I think this is undated. This is like, I think from the 1920s, but it's the closest thing I could find to fit with what I want to say. So her writing at 19 years old in her first book, it paints a super bleak portrait of Butte's landscape. So you got to remember she was writing in 1901. Um, this was two years after the organization of the Amalgamated Copper Mining Company, but it was a decade before the, the Anaconda copper mining company monopoly, like before, um, why am I blanking on their names? Someone in here knows, before the one guy bought everyone else out. Um, <laughs> so, what was that? Yeah, Daly, Clark, and then there was another one. Yeah, yeah, thank you. So the rivalry between the Copper Kings, so those three guys, it was still at a fever pitch, and the Mile High City was as cosmopolitan as it ever would be. Uptown was lined with elegant buildings, and Butte streets were packed with immigrants from all over the world. Um, the city bustled with activity 24-7 because men were coming off shifts night and day, and they were going on to shifts, and like things just never closed. Um, but Mary didn't find this exciting at all. She um, felt very far removed from um, the people around her in Butte, and she did not feel inspired at all by her surroundings. Um, really what she presents in um, I Await the Devil's Coming is a picture of a young woman who s thrives and finds herself in spite of her surroundings, not because of them. So she writes, I take walks far away in the open country, hence why I chose this photo of the Butte from the hill, uh, from the hillside. Butte and its immediate vicinity present as ugly an outlook as one could wish to see. It is so ugly indeed that it is near the perfection of ugliness. <laughs> and anything perfect or nearly so is not to be despised. I have reached some astonishing subtleties of conception as I have 
walked for miles over the sand and bareness among the little hills and gulches. Their utter desolateness is an inspiration to the long, long thoughts and to the nameless wanting. And then she continues. She calls this her peripatetic philosophy. Um, the writing that was inspired, the thoughts that were inspired by her walks, which she would walk for miles and miles and miles um, when not a lot of people were really doing that um, for fun, which basically is what she was doing. Um, we three go out on the sand and bareness. My wooden heart, my good young woman's body, my soul. We go there and contemplate the long, sandy wastes, the red, red line at the sky and the setting of the sun, the cold, gloomy mountains under it, the ground without a weed, without a grass blade, even in their season, for they have years ago been killed off by the sulfur smoke from the smelters. So McLean doesn't fit into the literary canon of the American West for a lot of reasons. Um, one, because she's a woman, a young woman, writing about very unfeminine things, basically writing about her feelings and her opinions more than writing about, okay, like when you think about like Edwardian, like early turn of the century literature and women's diaries, women's journals, what I've read a lot of is like kind of musings on morality, on spirituality, kind of, you know, maybe like a log of your everyday activities, which is great. Like they make for great historical documents. Um, but this is not what McLean was doing. She was doing something different. Um, she wrote also about her love and desire for her English teacher, Fanny Corbin, at, um, at the high school, who by the time um, Mary's book came out in 1902, Fanny Corbin had gotten a job, I think, at UM um, as an English professor. Um, so she wasn't around anymore when McLean was writing this, but she features um, heavily in this book, which is kind of incredible because she was this English teacher who, I mean, she accomplished a lot in her own way, but the fact that she is like this character in this book and really, I'm sure she eventually learned about her be, herself being in this book, but it's kind of funny that she was just immortalized by this 18 year old um, young woman. It's kind of interesting to think about. And when McLean was um, writing about Corbin, she, um, it, and McLean expressed a desire to be, to be masculine rather than to be possessed by the masculine, which when you read a lot of books by women at the, you know, in, um, in like the early 1900s, you read a lot about love and relationships and desire, but it's really um, the woman as this, as more often, mo feeling herself as this as passive, as receiving, not as active, which is not how McLean wrote about herself and her desires. Um, okay, so that's one way that she doesn't fit in. Two, she doesn't, um, and this I have to uh, attribute Catherine Halverson, who um, wrote about McLean and two other um, American women writing in the American West. Um, around the same time. I have to attribute this idea to her that McLean doesn't self-consciously locate herself in the West as a lot of regional writers did and continue to do. Um, she rather um, depicts Butte as a point of departure rather than as a destination. And she doesn't say, I'm from the, I'm from the West. She doesn't identify as being from the West. She's just like, I'm in Butte. Butte is its own, you know, she doesn't talk about it being in the West or on the frontier, even though she very easily could have, as Halverson points out, because of her father's um, legacy as Flatboat Charlie. She could have easily, you know, claimed that identity for herself, and she does not. Um, 
so McLean doesn't write about the West the way that we would expect her to. She writes about the sky, the hills, the water, the trees, but only insofar as they reflect her own inner turmoil, her own inner feelings. Um, for her, yeah, Butte is not Western in the way that we imagine the West today, in the way that, in the way that the West has come to mean the West to us. Um, it's a, not a paradise, it's not an Eden, it's a wasteland. It's not a place of opportunity, it's a place of limitations. Um, so she repeats these tropes over and over as we saw the sand in the bareness, the gray dawn, the red, red line, the, the sunset, um, the devil. And, and all these tropes, they kind of entwine her sense of personal um, dissatisfaction and wanting with the natural world around her. But she's not writing, she's not just like describing the scenery, you know? Um, and I don't mean that as a dismissal of Western writing. Of course I don't. I'm just saying that she's not writing about the West in the way that we have come to expect the West to be written about. Okay, third difference, and perhaps the most importantly, I already talked about, my notes are taking me in circles. Butte is a point of departure. It is not the end destination. Um, she didn't want to stay in Butte, but even as she's writing in her book about how dissatisfied and constrained and misunderstood she felt there, she knew, even as she's writing that at 19, she knows that Butte is leaving her, its imprint on her. Um, she already knew, even if she wasn't saying it directly in this first book, she knew that Butte was part of what made her brilliant. Um, so this is a picture, this is a cool picture um, of, um, I think it's called Miner's Union Day. Miner's Union Day. Um, I'm not sure of the exact year, but it was around the time when McLean was there. So she, McLean does talk about her fellow Butians, but um, not in a flattering way. Uh, she asks in this first book, can I be that thing which I am? Can I be possessed of a peculiar, rare genius and yet drag out my life in obscurity in this uncouth, warped Montana town? <laughs> so she writes about the crowds on the 4th of July in Miner's Union Day and she depicts, I mean, in incredible detail, it's very cosmopolitan vibe that it had in its heyday. She says, you know, there are not a great many people, 70,000 perhaps, and as we know, Butte's population is a point of contention among scholars. Um, she says 70,000, who knows where she comes up with that. She says, but those 70,000 are in their way unparalleled. For mixture, for miscellany, variedness, bohemianism, where is Butte's rival? A single street in Butte contains people in nearly every walk of life living side by side resignedly, if not in peace. This is a photo that um, is taken f from, okay, th so this is from 419 North Excelsior Street in Butte, which is the duplex where she and her family were living when she wrote this first book. And they think that this was her bedroom window. So if you can imagine her writing this book, looking out the window at the Anselmo head frame. Um, so, you know, she says Butte is a very diverse place. It's a very happening place. But for her, it doesn't excuse the city's shortcomings. Um, you know, for all that it bustles with activity, it's really not the kind of activity that appeals to her. Um, people drink, they fight, and most of all, they, they work. You know, it's a working city, you know, and they survive. Um, people, um, you know, for her, they were not reading enough, they were not thinking enough, they didn't understand themselves well enough um, for her to be interested in wanting to spend time with them. Um, she makes her feelings known very frankly. Uh, Butte is a place of sand and barrenness. The souls of these people are dumb. <laughs> So this is like the point in the presentation where I would be like, oh, teenagers, you know, what are you going to do? But I mean, this, uh, her, the way that she writes, it's like so funny and so like 
direct and so blunt. It's like, is this, is this really like 1902? You know, that's why I had to keep like looking back at it, the date when I was reading this book for the first time. Um, so McLean, that's her on the, on the right, posing in her traveling clothes somewhere probably on the East Coast. So she's $20,000 richer, virtually an overnight superstar. She takes the train to Chicago and she continues a speaking tour that she'd started at the behest of her publisher in Montana a few months earlier. Um, but loved to hate on McLean, even as they also profited from her fame, the, the Mary McLean highball. Um, <laughs> says, it cannot be related, <laughs> which cannot be resisted, sorry, by lovers of dainty summer drinks. It is cooling, refreshing, invigorating, and devilish good. New and up to date. So basically, Mary, person, Mary like, um, just all her qualities in a, in a cocktail. Um, <laughs> New Bro Drug Company on Main Street in Butte. Uh, okay, so they're naming cocktails after her, but they refuse to host her speaking event. They also ban her book from the public library, um, but this only drives up the price of the book at local bookstores to $5 a copy, which is a lot for the time. So in the end, their hate only benefits her, right? YouTube clicks. Um, so she was like, so in Chicago, she's in Chicago now, so she's set upon by journalists who at once they celebrate her. They're celebrating her way more than the um, press in Butte was. They celebrate her talent and her outspokenness as often as they deride her for those same qualities. They accuse her of exploiting the public's appetite for sensationalism, um, and at the same time, they dismiss her as disappointingly tame and run of the mill in the way that she dresses and speaks. Um, critics go after her, not only her writing style, but after her moral character and even after her very sanity. Um, there's also this like phenomenon um, that was spoken about. Um, actually, um, Emily Danforth, who's also a writer from Montana, Miles City. She wrote a novel called um, Plain Bad Heroines that um, was inspired by this phenomenon that happened after her first, after McLean's first book was published where these clubs of girls would get together and uh, um, basically Mary was kind of like this, this idol for, for them and she would, they would use her as a figure to a figure of inspiration. I don't know, you've, you've read the book, Elsie. I actually haven't read it yet, so maybe you can tell us more about it. Um, so they're talking about this phenomenon of like Mary McLean clubs that are popping up all over the country. Um, there's also this headline that I found, Mary McLean freaks of two Bozeman girls, saying that after these two girls in Bozeman read her novel, they like ran away from home in the middle of the night to be with their boyfriends in their like night robes. Like it's very sensational, incredibly. And they, they blame her for it, you know, that it's like it's, they're her, it's her fault because these women, these girls wouldn't have done it otherwise, you know, because girls aren't smart enough to like come make their own decisions if, unless they have a bad influence. Um, so at the same time, even as they're blaming her for all these things, they say she's just like any other girl which just goes to show that even after you make half a million dollars as the best-selling author and have your book translated into 30 languages, even then, you can't win. <laughs> you really can't. <laughs> okay, so um, her second book, My Friend Annabelle Lee, comes out in 1903. Um, like her first book, it was neither a memoir nor a diary nor a novel. It was kind of... Um, in between, but unlike the story of Mary McLean, it was a total flop. Um, critics dismissed it as derivative, and they implored her publisher not to publish a third book of hers unless, quote, this Western genius improves her style. Um, my friend Anna Belie, though, is um, 
uh, notable because um, for the first time, she, McLean is writing about her affection for Butte. She talks about her time at Butte High School um, with great sentimentality and nostalgia. She even writes, Butte in Montana is my first love. Um, but the book locked, it lacked the shock value of her first publication and the papers overwhelmingly concluded that she had for better or worse calmed way, way down and uh, she disappeared from the spotlight. Um, but she was having fun. She was spending her money. She went to Boston, New York, Florida. She wrote for newspapers. Um, she basically was enjoying the world that had opened up to her with this, all this money that she had. Um, she had relationships with men and with women. She took this 10-day cruise to Europe that she remembered mostly for how seasick she was, which is, um, I don't know, I think that's pretty sad. Like the first and last time that she leaves the country, she's like so seasick, sea she can't remember. I don't know, I think that's kind of tragic. Um, she says she remembers these years in the East and she spent, you know, uh, seven, eight years on the East Coast as mongrel, wasteful years, empty of every realness, every purpose, every vantage. They filled me with a bastard wisdom, which I think anyone in their 20s can relate to that feeling, looking back. Um, in 1910, she came back to Butte. She was 27 at this point. Um, some accounts say her stepfather forced her to return. Some say she chose to come back to focus on her writing. Either way, she was totally out of money. She was totally bankrupt, and she like got super sick after she came back. Um, uh, I'm forgetting exactly with what, but she got really s TB. TB, yeah, I think TB, and it basically, <coughs> I mean, that was like the beginning of the end for her health-wise. Um, so she came back, she says, to focus on her writing, and in this way we see her developing as a writer and as a person. Um, she's not resigning herself to her past or trying to escape, but rather she's returning to it as a way of furthering her art. She moves back in with her folks, who by now reportedly live in this house at 1007 West Park Street in Butte. And the Butte Intermountain hires her to write regular columns. Um, she describes in one column her homecoming to Butte as an incomparable thrill, which is really remarkable coming from someone who eight years earlier essentially had said, get me, get me out of here, like anywhere but here. Um, so she's in Butte, she's working on her third book. Um, I think there was another book that she abandoned in the middle some, somewhere, but her third book that came out was titled I, Mary McLean, um, A Diary of Human Days. Um, it was published by a different, um, house this time, New York City-based Frederick A. Stokes. Um, in form and in theme, it was way more like the story than her second, than Annabelle Lee. It was, I like this book of hers the most um, because she's a much better writer by this point in her life. It's more restrained, but it's still like, has that incandescent McLean fury that comes through at times. Um, and it's also written in the form of a, di of a diary, but each entry is dated tomorrow rather than the date, which is um, kind of fits in with the um, literary um, style of the time. You know, she's still like very evocative and precise in her writing, but now she seems to be more aware of her craft and the text itself. Like it's not just the words and the text are not just a vessel anymore for her emotions. She's very much aware of the, 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 crafts, the craftsmanship of what she's doing. Um, let's see, I found this, I wanted to read this excerpt from her third book where she's talking about how she chooses the um, vocabulary she uses in her books, um, talking about this imagined hierarchy she has of vocabulary. She says, um, then I turn to a tier of words that represents the, the virile middle class in words, the lowercase words, the mob and riot words, the words for poets and anarchists and prophets. 
such as Adwat and Nightingale and Gallows and Gutter and Woman and Madrigal and Death. And I say, without doubt, here are my words, but I use discretion. I know that tier of words to be of the nature of bombs, of strychnine, of a dynamic force resistible against all human and worldly substance. They also must be used cautiously and with a sparing, ha and with a sparing hand. With caution, one can handle a bomb, and sparingly, one can eat strychnine, <laughs> and one can control any dynamic force by studying its tendencies and keeping out of its direct road. Um, so, I mean, like, as you mature as a writer, you become more aware of the power that you yield and I, with words, and I think that's what is happening here. Um, so I do want to say, and this is like wholly my opinion, even as McLean has been resurrected, um, her writing itself remains kind of underappreciated. Um, everyone t kind of tends to quote the same sound bites over and over. Um, for example, when she says and writes in her first book, um, may I never, I say, become that abnormal, merciless animal, that deformed monstrosity of virtuous woman. <laughs> um, it's super funny, it's super well written, but it's not totally representative, representative of her full abilities as a writer, you know, by the time that she, you know, is in her 20s and 30s. Um, uh, if you, do we have, Time to read another quote. Do you guys want to hear another quote? Yes. Okay. All right. So this is just as an example of how her writing has developed. And again, when you're like reading her, like her third book is my favorite, but I think you really have to read her first book first to appreciate how she has developed by the time she's writing her third book. Okay. So this is from her third book, I, Mary McLean. She's writing about... Um, comparing the beauty of her childhood to the beauty of now, you know, um, 15 years later. A very few years ago, what one could count on one's fingers, there were no lids on this butte. Every summer, bony thoroughbred horses from Juarez and Denver raced around the oval track on the flat, watched by a shrieking, bedding throng of butte citizens and sidonesses, ridden by silk-bloused, black-booted jockeys, their finished spurts under the wire chaperoned by a flock of bookmakers. Roulette and poker and faro were wide open in the town and flavored the air with the taste of gray purple hazard. Gin palaces and mining camp dance halls, highly deluxed, lent their tinted breath to the current. Noodleish and little bacchanalian dives flourished in unexpected nooks. The police court on a Monday morning resembled the debris from an alcoholic human volcano, a condemned but owned portion of this butte in its butte Montana-ness. All of it was but one element in an isolated, prosperous town of many elements, but it some way tinctured all. Um, I mean, that's quite a way to write about a place that she had nothing good to say about, you know, um, 10 years earlier. Uh, so really, it, quite incredible writing. Uh, but unfortunately, the book didn't do that great or didn't do as good as her first book. Um, it did well enough, though, to catapult her back into the public eye, and she was once again able to leave Butte, um, which she must have wanted to do because that's what she did. She was invited to, in New York, produce, direct, and star in a silent movie um, based actually on a column she'd written in 1910 for the Butte Intermountain. Uh, the movie was titled Men Who Have Made Love to Me. <laughs> she, uh, it's a silent film. She recounts her rejections of several male lovers, including the callow youth, literary man, younger son, prize fighter, bank clerk, and husband of another. <laughs> so no copies of this movie remain. <laughs> I don't know if that's, we should be surprised or not, but it was advertised all over the place and it um, reportedly, reportedly is the first documented film to break the fourth wall because she stares right into the camera at the end. Um, report, apparently it's the first film to do that. Okay, so Mary McLean, she dies in 1929. I think that makes her like 47 just months before the stock market crash. 
um, sensationalism stays with her like up until the end. She reportedly dies alone in a hotel room in Chicago. Um, some papers report it having happened after an unsuccessful abdominal surgery. Um, she turned to prostitution at some point um, before coming back to Butte, and she likely had to go back to that when she was in Chicago um, because she was totally impoverished. So she kind of really sadly um, called it when she wrote in her um, one of the columns for the Intermountain. She says, the thing I took away with me from Butte seven years ago, a restlessness of spirit, a shadowed and turbulent mentality, a lack of inward peace, is the thing I've brought back with me, and what will follow me to what I trust will be a young grave. Um, Jessica Crispin, who's a um, writer working today, she wrote the introduction to the reprint of I Await the Devil's Coming in 2013. Crispin said, dying on your downswing can be a horrible thing for your posthumous career. Um, but McLean can't be said to lack a legacy. Um, feminist scholars unearthed her writing in the 1970s when it had been out of print basically since before she died. Um, Bill McGregor down in Butte, um, who's a professor emeritus at Montana Tech, is restoring her first Butte home on North Excelsior. This is the um, uh, house that that first photo of the head frame was taken from. Um, so this, he's been doing this for like 30 years. Um, so, and I would call this definitely a project inspired by Mary's writing. Um, he also just ordered a National Register plaque from the Historical Society, thanks to Christine. Um, so there's also been a PBS documentary about her, I think in 2014. There have been tons of student films made about her, tons of stage plays, folk music inspired by her, which you can find on YouTube. Um, her books were reprinted again in the 90s by scholar Michael Brown, whom I believe might be related to her younger sister, I think, don't quote me on that. Um, so he reprinted her books and then in 2013, Melville House Publishing reprinted the story of Mary McLean under its original title, um, as well as her third book, um, I, Mary McLean. Um, again, Emily uh, Danforth wrote Plain Bad Heroines. Um, Suzanne Shope is a Missoula producer who's making a short narrative film about Mary, which is scheduled to start shooting in Butte next year. Um, these are more photos of uh, her house. This is the work. I just got these photos from Bill. So they, um, as part of the condition for getting um, funding to reconstruct her home, they have to try to their best to return it to its historic character. And there were three columns on this. You can see what bad condition the porch was in um, when uh, Bill acquired the home in the 90s. That was actually, take, that first photo was taken just last year. Um, this is from like a few weeks ago. They're reconstructing the porch and they're also reconstructing those pillars. This contractor down in Belgrade who um, has very specialized skills and is reconstructing those three pillars complete with the capitals. Um, it's pretty incredible. Um, so McLean, she wanted more than anything to leave something behind. Uh, that's why she wrote. Um, I feel like she'd be pretty happy with her legacy, although she'd probably be pretty amused um, that there are talks being given about her today in public libraries. Um, you know, again, I'm gonna, uh, again, defer to Kath, that um, English professor, Catherine Halverson, who wrote that book, Maverick um, Autobiographies. She puts it like this, she says, the um, excess of the American West that in male texts is so often incarnated by violence, instead in, in McLean it takes the form of supreme self-confidence and devotion to self. So in the end, even though she would have been horrified to be called a Western writer, that's what she is. Um, so, <coughs> and an American writer and a woman writer and all of that, but she is also a writer of the West. Um, 
anyone who wants this, I'm happy to email this to you, but these are like more, you can find her books in the public domain on Project Gutenberg. You can also check them out here. Um, there's audio books um, on YouTube that you can listen to. Um, I put my favorite recording right there. It's by um, Libra, LibriVox. I don't know if that's how you say it. Um, also a ton of research that's been done on her, that Katherine Halverson book, Maverick Autobiographies. Two articles that came out in the 70s in Montana, the magazine of Western History, um, which is our um, in-house publisher, or the magazine of our in-house publisher. Um, also, I mentioned before that like um, folk musician who was writing like um, songs using McLean's text as the lyrics. You can listen to it on YouTube, and it's it's really cool. Like it's a cool project. So. Um, thanks for coming out. I think I almost took up the whole hour, but I would love to like field any questions, any comments, anything that you know about Mary that I, you know, because I'm still learning about her. Um, I love to learn more. So thank you all so much for coming. anyone has any questions, please raise your hand and don't speak until I come to you so you can speak into their microphone and that way we'll be able to get it on a recording that will go up on YouTube so everyone else can hear your question as well. So does anyone have something they want to ask? Okay. Where is she buried? That's a great question. <laughs> I don't know. I would imagine in Chicago. I actually don't know. That's a really good question. I wonder if her grave is even marked, to be honest. You know, knowing what her uh, um, straights were at the end of her life. That's a good research question. I'll look up, find a grave. Okay, sounds good. Other questions? Um, you'd said she'd written a lot of articles and was hired uh, to do so in, in Butte, I believe. Has, has there ever been a compendium or anything of that collected and organized um, regarding her works? Yes, thank you for asking. I believe there is at least um, one. So Michael Brown, the um, scholar whom I um, mentioned who uh, reprinted her, who was the first to reprint her books after like a long, long uh, lag. He put out this collection that I have at home. Um, well, a couple. OK, so these are the two he has listed in this, in this printing, which came out in 2014. Human Days, a Mary McLean Reader, which I think includes some of her articles. And then Tender Darkness, a Mary McLean sampler, which is the one that I have, and that has a copy of her, it has the text of her first book in there. And it has a collection, an interview with her by, I think, the New York Globe, which is a really funny interview to read, and then also five or six of her selected columns. Um, but also, like, if you go onto the Library of Congress, um, which you can access for free, and you can, it takes some doing, but if you like search Mary McLean, um, filter it down to like, Mont, you know, Butte articles or like the Butte Intermountain, you can find a lot of her stuff digitized, um, not because she wrote it, but just because it's in the Butte Intermountain, which has been largely digitized. And I think, right, we're working on, didn't, I just read about this. Didn't we, the Historical Society, don't we have like a digitization project going on? Um. Currently, the, a lot of the Historical Society newspaper um, records are being digitized. I don't remember what point we're at in that process. I don't know if any of our colleagues in the audience remember. It's all done? It's all, done. It's all finished. Anyone can access it if you get onto our website first. Wait, stop. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't follow the rules. Um, I'm pretty sure the newspaper digitization project is complete, and if you um, access newspapers.com through the Montana Historical Society website, newspapers.com portal, um, it's free. 
and you can search any number of possibly hundreds of Montana newspapers. So it might, it might be in there. Awesome. Um, that was uh, Christine Brown. She's our science coordinator in the Outreach and Education Department. Uh, not a question, but just to add to the newspaper thing, um, in those newspaper articles, you can find the uh, the uh, original articles she was using for the men to make uh, the men who made love to me. So you can find each of the little short segments that she wrote about the f seven different types. Awesome. Thanks for all the info, everyone. Um, do we have any last questions? Back to Christine. This isn't a question, but I think it's really interesting in all of the pictures that you showed of Mary McLean, I think half of them, or maybe more than half, she's staring directly into the camera. And I look at a lot of historic photos in the work that I do, and you don't see that that often. Um, even when in that first picture with her family, she's like, what, 10 or 12? And she's staring directly into the camera. So I think that's really interesting. She had a really interesting um, relationship with the camera. And you say that she did that in that movie where she breaks the, the fourth wall. Um, so it's just something interesting, I think, that um, to think about. And maybe someone's done some research or writing about that. It would be interesting to know. I, yeah, I totally agree, Christine. That's like a great, I've never thought about it in quite the way that you put it, but yeah. Most of the photos you show, she's like. Yeah, it's quite intimidating. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like now it doesn't seem remarkable, but when you put it in the context of the early 1900s, you're like, wow. Yeah, because even the. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. It is remarkable. I'm trying to find her out and find a grave. What year was she born and what year did she die? Um, 1881 to 1927. Yeah. The, the grave's not there. I looked. <laughs> okay, so that's everyone's homework. Find Mary McCain's <laughs> grave and send us an email and so we can <laughs> let you all know. <laughs> send us an email when you find out. Thank you. <laughs> she died in Chicago. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. She died of TB. She had scarlet fever when she got sick of you. Oh, she got, okay, yeah. thank you. Okay, scarlet fever. Yeah, all those things kind of, yeah. Christine has one more question. Oh. <laughs> this is an actual question. Um, do you know if her second residence um, is still there? Google Maps, it is there. If that is indeed, if that was indeed her second residence, yeah. it looks kind of, it looks, it's recognizable, but it looks different. Like, but it is still, that house that we showed is still there, but it's not called out um, as her having lived there, of course, because even her first house, you know, wasn't people like don't, I think Bill said that it's like on the route for the um, historical tours they do in Butte. Like people will like stop in front of his house and, you know, talk about it. But he only just ordered that plaque. So, you know, maybe the people living in the house need a call. To like more research to do. More research. <laughs> Okay, so we've hit 7.30, so unless there's any last questions, I think we'll call it there. So thank you guys all for attending. Remember, we do have upcoming lectures. <laughs>a so big thanks to Lindsay. If you want to sign up for our mailing list, it's over there. And you can take a look at our flyers for our upcoming talks as well. Have a good evening. <laughs>